conversations actually yesterday. So when I was putting this talk together, I thought about starting with the precise definition of uh, what computational thinking is about. But I wanted to also show this as a complex system. And as any complex system, when you try to model it after um, an oral or writing, you risk losing some, some really essentials. Um, so instead, we're going to just play with some exercises to see what computational is not first. Um, how many people have seen this? Cool, win. So if you, oh, okay, don't, don't take the answer yet. Just hold off to it. So if this bus was going to start moving, which direction would it go? Which Left or right? Which Wait. <laughs> Who thinks it's going to go left? Wait, this is your left. Yes. <laughs> Are you sure about that? Okay. Who's going to think it's going to go left? Right? All right. So would you be surprised if I said that? They were actually showing this uh, to kids who, very small kids, five, six years old, who go take bus to school every day. And instantly, without even really thinking, they came up with the correct answer, over 80%. And the reason is, for them, they don't really need to sit and think and analyze and do computational thinking. It's just common sense for them. So here's a, here's a hint. Where is the door of the bus? On the other side. So yes, so if this bus starts moving, in US, um, the door of the bus is on the other side because you don't see it here. That means the driver is sitting on this side. That means the bus is going to left. So I haven't seen school bus in Cape Town, but if this was in UK or here, um, it would be going to the right side. So those of you who raise your hand is correct, right? But this kind of, this kind of problems are very contextual. It's just, it really depends on who you are, where you are, and it really depends on the environment. So problem like this or the common sense is not really computational thinking. Art, art is another thing. So the value of the art is not really computational thinking, you know? Like Saudi Prince thought that this painting by uh, Leonardo da Vinci worth 450 million US dollars. And that's actually one of the most expensive art ever been sold. Can we reason with that? No, because I think the last time it was sold, it was somewhere around 10,000. Um, so somebody thought this is extremely valuable art and decided to put that value on it. We can't reason with it. Another example is when I was thinking about what is definitely not computational thinking, I learned that my husband used to go to mosh pit. So my reaction was just like, why would you do that? Like, are you out of your mind? Um, so when you're in a mosh pit, you're not thinking computationally. Like, that's for sure. Unless, <laughs> he was probably the, the dude in the middle who just like, you know, does this and then jumps in the crowd. Um, so unless, unless you're a physics student who just learned about the collective behavior a couple of weeks back. So this student, um, Jesse Silverberg, he was a PhD in physics who just learned about this concept a few weeks back and he loved going to mosh pits. It just happened that in one of these, uh, you know, events, he was watching mosh pit from the top and it just hit him. It's just like, this is collective behavior. So he came back home and he actually built this simulation. This is pretty awesome. Um, now, some people say computational thinking is like thinking like a programmer. Is it? Right? How many full stack developers are in the house? All right. So if computational thinking is thinking like a programmer and if we hire enough programmers, then we should never have a problem dealing with this sort of uh, problems at work, right? Um, it just happens that sometimes when we hire full stack developers, we actually hire the full stack overflow developers. Um, <laughs> And this is when some of us, not naming who, um, you know, we got some problems in the code. We go Google that. We run into some snippet of a code, really don't really know, understand what it's doing, just copy paste in our code, get a new error, just go Google that again, and just, it just repeats itself. Um, so no, computational thinking is not really thinking like a programmer. So hopefully I got your attention, so let me introduce myself. I'm Sara Aslanifar. I'm from Chicago, originally from Iran. Um, I came to US 20 years ago. 
Um, so I started programming about 25 years ago, and my first language was DOS. Uh, it was fun. Um, this is back at the time that we didn't have computers in the house, and I just learned about this shiny new device that I could you know, solve problems differently. So I had to go across the city just to really see what this is about. Um, and then I decided to migrate to U.S. So I came to U.S. for my undergrad. I studied, um, I think back then, the official first language in computer science department was C. So I learned C and then C++, and then I figured out I need to make money. So, um, you know, we changed the first language to be Java. So I had to self-teach Java so I can get a job. And then back then, we were on Strut and Hibernate. And right around then, I got hired at uh, State Farm. So Spring came out, and then Play, and then Spark Framework, and then I got hired at ThoughtWorks, uh, which we started on Ruby and Rails. It was pretty big. You know, after ThoughtWorks, I learned the cool guys around me were or cool girls who were learning Python and R and then Clojure and then Angular and React and C Sharp and Swift and React Native and Terraform and .NET. Um, I had some crash course on Lisp and PHP and all that. Elixir is now cool. And I just had to just stop myself, like, what are you doing? I'm just like going after the fashion to see which language is cooler and who's learning what, which is great. Some of us have that passion that we want to be expert in what we do, but that wasn't really me. So I had to like kind of step back and really get back to where, why I fell in love with programming, which was because this new tool gave me something to think about or something to solve the problem around me just in a different way. So that's why I started this computational thinking and really go deep into what is it that I'm going to solve anyway, and then choose whatever language fits the best. So that's my professional life. My personal life, I'm a mother of two very curious kids. Armin, who's the older one, he is the thinker and the planner, and Aydin is a risk turkey and the executor, and he doesn't really think about the consequences. So a couple years back, um, you know, my company at the time, they were asking, like interviewing this young kids to send cute holiday message to our clients. So they interviewed my son and they asked him, what does your mom do at Morningstar? He looked dead in the eye and said, nothing. <laughs> so here goes my promotion out the door. <laughs> but at the same time, uh, he was really curious that why am I on the computer all day, but then not let him to use computers or iPads or iPhones. So I was like, okay, I can, I can put that in my benefit. I started teaching him some algorithms without really introducing it as algorithms. So I started teaching him merge sort and bucket sort and have him do really cool laundry sorting for me, which was awesome because I don't have to do laundry. I don't like it. Um, so that's how I started with Armin and Ivan to introduce them to uh, basics of com computers, basically. And uh, it was funny because when I was teaching the older one, Merge Sword, the first time, the first thing he asked me is like, well, if I learned that, how much money would I earn? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> we just got to wait for another 10 years. So this is first grade. Um, my son's school, they had this great program that they invited parents to come in and talk about professional life. Like, what do they do? So of course it was my turn, and instead of taking the computer and introducing syntax programming, I decided to go back to basics again. So I took a stack of cards from one to 100. So there are 20 students in the class, I gave them five cards random each, and uh, we put some buckets um, on the table. So like one through 10, 11 through 20, and so on. So and then encourage kids to go and put their cards in the correct bucket. Um, they did that, they had fun, and then we took, so the students were impaired down now, they each took a bucket um, and they started sorting their cars however they wanted, bubble sort. Um, so each one person was sorting the card and the other one was testing to make sure that it's correct. And what I really wanted them to, to do is to really have a different way of thinking about their day-to-day -day life. And all I wanted to do is some sort of confirmation that now that they learn this thing, are they going to use it around the house or in their day-to-day -day job? Um, so before we know it, within a couple minutes, we actually had sorted cards. So this was fun. Again, my goal wasn't really introducing syntax, but I, my goal was to build character strength in these kids. 
Um, first one was teamwork. Like, I really wanted to show them you're better and you can do better results if you work in team. Therefore, you know, one person does a code, the other one does a test. Resilience, you know, the first couple times that somebody got a card wrong, they were on tears, upset. So that's when we just flipped it around and introduced the notion of bugs and debugging. And now they had fun, they were just yelling around, we got a bug, you know, who's this card for? And they would go give it to the other person. Curiosity, we just wanted to make sure that I don't know is okay. Like, I don't know, can you help me? I'm stuck. And we would just hold everybody, explain everything again, make sure everybody's comfortable and they can do what they're supposed to do. And empathy, nobody was left behind. They had fun throughout this exercise and the other one. Um, and again, like this was very important for me because I wanted to show kids that they don't have to be in STEM lab in order for them to learn something new or to really think computationally or learn algorithms. So I got what I needed just the day after. The teacher sent me a message and she said that they were, um, the kids were working on writing about civil war leaders, and they suggested that let's put buckets with topics on the table, and then we're going to sort our writings, and then that became the table of content. So, win. So that was great. Um, and that brings me to this beautiful quote from, um, from John McLuhan, that, uh, uh, John Culkin, that he says, life imitates art. So we shape our tools, and thereafter they shape us. My take on that is that there is information in the artifact that we produce as culture, and, and that over time is going to change us and it's going to change our culture. So let me take you through history. Another, somebody said that, you know, we always have to look at the history to understand where we're from. Uh, so most researchers date human, uh, modern human, to about 200,000 years ago in Africa. And for all that time, but small fraction, um, we just relied on oral communications to, to pass experience and knowledge from generation to generation. And some of you might be familiar with the telephone game where people stand in a line, somebody says something in the beginning of the line, by the time it gets to the end of the line, it's something completely different, right? So when the message changes, there's no objective truth. And that's why we don't have much information from, from that area about how our, our ancestors lived their lives. Um, and that's why we call it prehistoric, right? Because we just don't have any, any truth to see you know, what was going on. We can't even, even really call them illiterate because the writing system didn't even exist. It just, it was not the thing. So Walter Ong, um, he's a researcher and he actually studied the impact of um, cultures going from orality to, to literacy, and I really love this, um, so you don't have to answer it, but think about it. He basically showed these two group of cultures who were oral, and those who know writing and reading and writing, and asked them which one of these don't belong. So think about that for a second. So what he found out that in oral cultures, the concept, like the concept of abstract, it doesn't really exist. It's, um, you know, it, the, it minimizes the abstraction and it focuses greatly on the situations that are very well known by, by the speaker. So oral cultures are very practical, right? So when they showed this to oral cultures and said, which one doesn't belong? Um, people were thinking, okay, there's an ax and a saw and a lock. I could use that to cut the lock. So therefore the hammer does not belong. But for, for the rest of us who are in system and we know how to, we have a concept of sets and tables and categorizing things. We look at this and say, okay, we got a set of tools and a log, therefore the log does not belong. So that just shows you that writing actually restructures your consciousness and the way you're actually thinking about the world around you. So that telephone game went on for thousands and thousands of years until about five, 6,000 years ago is when we start seeing some artifacts, right? And the alphabet actually started coming about a thousand years after that. So even, even by that time, we had a writing system. Not everybody saw it necessary to really learn to read and write. What are they gonna do with it anyway? And in fact, in you know, medieval Europe, in Greek, in Egypt, um, that was confined to just elites. So there were scribes and there were religious, uh, religious people um, who know how to read and write. And the commoners weren't even allowed to learn that because 
information was power. And of course, they didn't want commoners and people to become powerful. So that went on, and right around 15, mid 15th century, things started to change for craft literacy. When, um, when Johannes Gutenberg, he uh, invented the printing press. Um, and that was a huge, huge infection, uh, invention and effect in our culture and who we are today. Um, you know, it suddenly that made it possible for information to be captured, to be produced, to be preserved over time and space. And we could, you know, we knew what was read, what was published, and who read it, and what was the thought. And people could now suddenly stand on shoulder of the giants, right? You didn't have to reinvent, or the message was captured. You can build on it and build on it and come up with better ideas. So let's see what happened. Right around 1400, the population of the world was about 389.77 million people. In four centuries, that population almost doubled, a little bit over. What happened to printing? We went from close to zero to almost a billion printed books. So this is a breakdown. By the way, this is from a website called Our World in Data. If you're interested, it's like a really awesome website. So let's see what happened to literacy rate. This is just in Europe. But about 1475, you see that less than 20% of people knew how to read and write. And just about, again, four centuries, that doubled, almost doubled in many places. Not, not everywhere, not sure what happened with a couple of those countries that went down. But for the most part, it just went up. And this is when the printing press happened. So you can see that the, there is a huge jump here and on. So Marshall McLuhan, he is a philosopher, or he was a philosopher. Um, here, up in his quote, he actually talks about the effect of media in our culture and life. But in the same way, you know, printing made literature possible. It didn't merely just encode it. And by, by that, by literature, I don't mean just Shakespeare, books like Shakespeare. I mean books like this. So this is a trigonometric function book written in 1619. And just books like this in craft literacy area, it, it was unheard of. Like, who would write this book? Write scribes? That was extremely error prone. So this was the data that now we were able to capture and use and make our lives better. Um, this is software conference. Anybody knows what we call this in our world? World of software? It's a cache. Because you, you look up the information that you need and immediately it gives you some answers. So you, know, you don't need to really think too hard about it. So who wrote this book? Um, Matthias Berniger's. He was a mathematician growing up in Protestant Reformation area after printing press um, who you know, was able to produce books and data like this to later be used by um, you know, the captains in the ships and the architects and so on. So let's come about a couple hundred years forward. This is Betty Stafford. Um, you know, people like Betty Stafford, um, they were recruited during World War II from the PhD program to come in and work in um, uh, the company who was the precursor to NASA. And they were praised to do more in one morning than aerospace engineer could do throughout the whole day. And here in this example, Betty is actually writing and capturing her thoughts and the function of how to convert um, a log 10 of a number from a more modern equivalent to Berniger's book to a natural log. So yes, like she had some cal like calculators and some devices, but a lot of these happen in her head and just explain, like just imagine that she, if she had to explain all of these to her child without really having a system to write it down. So World War II, what happened in another World War II was that a massive amount of fund uh, was poured into research and development of um, mechanical computers. Um, and the reason was, um, you know, in, in course of like the war and the ship, the captain had, to, had more than 20 inputs that he had to consider before sending an order to the guns, right? They had to know how fast is the ship is moving, what direction it is, what's the speed, like what, what's the wind speed, how far is the target, um, how fast is the target moving, and so on. And the output of that was basically that train and elevation order that had to be sent to, to guns to fire. So people use computers like this by putting actually 
um, the gears in a very particular state. And then the computation happened when throughout the, the movement of those shafts and gears and, and so on. So these were not general purpose computers. This is a very specific build for one thing. Another thing that happened during World War II is that, again, we started seeing a lot of funds going through building um, the general electronic computers, which um, ENIAC was one of them. So ENIAC's first program was the simulations for the thermonuclear um, calculations for the H-bomb that was not possible with mechanical, old mechanical computers, right? Um, so this was, this was great. This was the first electronic computers that we see that's actually programmable. Um, actually, just hint, the first programmers, these are the computers and they were women. Um, so they, they, not only they had to know what the problem is, come up with a solution, but they also had to know about this physical computers and reprogram by moving the cables, literally moving the cables around. So you can see how time consuming it is. Um, you know, sometimes like fixing a bug would take a week. So just imagine that. Um, but again, like these women needed something, some layer, some abstraction to let them focus on the problem at hand and not really like physically go in and rewire the computer. Imagine the world of Ruby, you want to just rewire your machine to like execute, you know, bundle exec. Um, I absolutely love this, this picture. Um, this is called the abstractometer um, and it's done by uh, Christoph Niemann. So what he's trying to show you here is that when, when your models are too realistic, um, it just takes away from, from the meaning that you, you really need, right? And when you put too much abstractions, it just doesn't mean anything. So Valentine's Day is coming. Please don't send leaky abstractions to your partners. Um, <laughs> it's just not right. So somewhere in between, somewhere in the middle is when you, the, there is enough abstractions for you to focus on the job and also you know, learn the tools that you're using. So 1945 is the von Neumann architecture and that finally gave us the stored program. So this was a perfect thing for us to kind of get the minds off uh, from focusing on the physical computer and changing the cables around to really understand what the problem is and what the solution is and try to focus on that. Then the concept became code and the code is now data, automatically executed by a machine. So let's, let's look at this example again. So in this example, Betty Stafford is learning or documenting the concept of downwash. Um, she had to probably write all of these down, send an order for this thing to get built, send it to a lab, get tested, come back home, and then adjust some numbers um, and redo again, right? So the, the feedback at this time is just so long. And on this side, we have Lorena Barb. She's a professor and she was just learning or teaching her students a similar concept about computational fluid dynamic. What does she do? She opened up Jupyter Notebook, write a few lines of code, execute and see how that executes, and then she can adjust. So that's a matter of minutes versus, I mean, who knows, weeks, months? So again, concept become codes and code is not data. So let's just see what happened. We are amongst the first generations in the history um, who are able to iteratively explore our concepts on a machine that execute instructions with no subjective judgment or permission required. Sometimes you do have to, you know, give it sudo, make me a sandwich, but, you know, it's, the, the computer doesn't really judge you based on who you are, the gender, the sex, the race, nothing. Um, so this makes our, our ideas falsifiable and tangible. And also we have now an object to really think with and come up with, with our data to be able to prove it and to share it around the world almost instantly. This is another great example. So um, programming to learn uh, was specially encouraged right around 1984. And this book, the SICP book, was used in MIT for the, uh, it was a required course in electrical engineering and computer science. And it went on to be used with another, in another 100 colleges or so in 1990s. And you can see here how beautifully this code actually gets translated. They're using Lisp in this book. 
So now map provides a precise declarative of what is, and computation provides a precise imperative of how to do something. Uh, many people actually don't know, but Jerry Sussman, uh, Gerald Sussman, he went on exploring physics and wrote this book in 2000 um, using programming Lisp. So he used his skills of programming to actually learn something new and, and understand how the physics work. And that brings us to this quote from Donald Knuth when he says, teaching something to a computer and expressing it precisely enough as an algorithm and translating it via programming language leads to a much deeper understanding than a traditional methods of learning does. So going back to this again, um, this is something that Dave Thomas actually brought up and I absolutely love it. He said, you don't stop when you reach a perfect model. You stop when you have an imperfect model that you understand. So when you write code, write it in such a way that you recreate that computational thinking um, that went into your design so that if somebody joins your team a week later, a month later, a year later, they actually understand what was in your head when you wrote that piece of code. Next is identify the need um, to decompose that abstractions and unpack the suitcase depending, depending on your needs. Sometimes all you need is just to put a couple debuggers around and just go down a couple levels to understand how the code works and how your code gets executed. Other times you do copy and paste and as long as you understand uh, you know, why you're doing it and what goes to your code, then that's perfectly fine, why not? But if you've never opened any abstraction you work with and understand it, the chance is that you're a power user. Um, you know, you might just care about the end result and not really care about, you know, what you do. Sometimes that's why we open Jupyter Notebook and write a few codes quickly to see something. And are you okay with it? Other times, if you open all the abstractions um, and learn very deep, the chances are that you're a professor in um, academics in computer science department. Are you okay with it? Um, apply program, pragmatic programming, so master the tools that you're using every day so that they get away um, from your, your focus to actually focus on the real problem at hand. And think about those, uh, the subjects that you and your team are going to benefit from, from much deeper learning. So with that, all models are wrong, some are useful. If I were to define computational thinking, I would say that computational thinking is, is an iterative system of generative reasoning in which people build models of subject in a notation capable, by, capable of being executed objectively and automatically by a machine with observable and falsifiable outcome or outputs. So again, that comes kind of brings me back to this code that we shape our tools and thereafter they shape our culture and us. There's a lot of concerns these days you hear about the future of AI and the machine learning and you know nobody's wrong, the risk is there because what if the code that I write as an engineer gets in the hand of people who use it in the wrong way? You know what if my code that I develop for a hardware or something is going to hurt somebody's life? And you know what's worse? If that bug was actually preventable with a little bit of thinking, a little bit of documentation. So, let me tell you what happened on Monday when I was on my way to beautiful Cape Town. I started getting bombarded by emails and messages from my friends in Chicago because it's election time. So, anybody familiar with uh, election time in US or heard the news? Exactly. Regardless of your political view, so this is a very critical time in the United States um, because they're about to choose the next president. So the Democratic Party decides to build an app this year to help with, you know, uh, help the candidates and see who is the most popular between the Democratic, Democratic candidates. So let me tell you a little bit about how caucus works. So this is Iowa caucus. Traditionally, this is a very big event people go to one of these 1,600 locations throughout Iowa to show their support for the candidate that they want to see um, basically battling the, the Republican candidate. So they physically stand in a line 
And if a line has less than 15%, those people have to now disperse and go to other lines. So there's a headcount that they do. And at the end of the day, they have to aggregate this, these results and basically see who's the most popular person. So this year, they decide to use an app. And then that news took over internet on Tuesday and became a global news. Why? Because the app did not actually um, report it. It just reported partial information. That by itself wasn't bad, but one of the, one of the candidates, Mayor Buttigieg, he actually put money into building this app. Um, and with partial report, it just showed that he is the winner, so he's a popular candidate. So he goes in and he declares victory. Bernie Sanders, which is not really known for his calm manners, he goes in and he's like, I saw it, I'm the winner, this was obvious. So again, we don't have data because the app failed on its face. Um, so this now creates a lot of troubles. They come back and apologizing for this code glitch and we are here, we know that these this things could happen, like, right, something goes wrong, but because now Mayor Buttigieg put money into this thing, now this is suddenly, for the other parties, this is not a bug, it's a feature. You see where I'm coming from? So this, this was actually pretty big uproar. Um, how could this be prevented? So they put this app together on a shoestring budget in two months. And it was built by a company called Shadow, which a couple very junior engineers worked on it who they needed the help and the support of their senior engineer. Who was a senior engineer? A person who never had any experience with mobile development. Beautiful, so they use all wrong platforms and if you're interested to read more, let's just geek out together. Um, so, moral of the story, when you're about to deploy an app for such a big event, just give yourself a little time, you know, make sure you test it properly, who are the audience, how is it going to be used. The second example is the Mars Climate Orbiter. So this one, um, some of you might be familiar with it, basically in 1998, NASA launches this orbiter and on September 23rd, 1999, Communication just drops out, and we don't know what happened. So right before the disconnect, the navigation team basically raised an alarm that the altitude is much lower than expected. So the team decides to lock it, decides to put a fix together, and deploy 24 hours before, um, before the insertion, before the, before the maneuver, in the hope that you know, the, the, the um, spacecraft is going to survive. So spacecraft, of course, like, does what it's supposed to do, but 49 seconds early. So we don't know what happened. Whether it just got crashed or went back to space, the communication just dropped out. I mean, guys, this was three million, three twenty-seven million dollar project. And what happened? Did we just monkey patched? Uh, did we just say we don't have time to test, so let's just put the bug and see what's gonna happen? Um, the, the bug here was that uh, Lockheed used the United States customary system, which are inch and foot and yard and mile. Don't ask me why, because I still don't understand it after 20 years. Um, and NASA was expecting metric system, which was clearly in the specification documents. So who is here to blame? The project manager, the engineer who built it, NASA, Lockheed. All we know is that that was a very, very hefty cost. Moral of the story here, unit testing are important, but when you're dealing with several integration tests, integration tests are very, very, very important. Please don't skip them so that you can, I don't know, optimistic. Another example of this, I'm almost done, I promise. Um, another example that really shocked me was um, this lady, Karen, Karen Sandler. She was, um, she had a big heart. I mean, literally a big heart. Uh, there's a medical term for it, I can't pronounce it, it's a tongue twist for me. But what she has to do is to wear a device so that the device can control her heartbeat and heart rate. So this lady becomes pregnant. What a shocker, right? And um, you know, for those who have children, 
you know that pregnant women actually get heart race from time to time, and, and it races so fast that it in itself like creates panic, so then you get more heart race. Um, not a cardiologist, but heart race during pregnancy by itself is not really cause of concern, except in her case. Her device shocked her twice during pregnancy because the device was never tested on women who are pregnant. I mean, what a shocker, right? Who thought about that? Um, luckily, she's safe. <laughs> But you can think that she wasn't able, even able to see what could cause it. Um, the worst part was that she was told by her cardiologist to take medications to bring her heart rate down so that the device doesn't shock her. Um, yeah, that's perfect advice. Um, so computational thinking can be and should be system thinking, really. Uh, where, the code, where, where is your code is going to be running? Who is going to use it? What's your demographic? And when the impacts of failure are high, we have an ethical obligation to object doing shoddy work. Um, you know, people might pay for us, they may not understand, but you're the last line of defense. So think about what you're, what you're putting out to the world. Um, and a few more takeaways here. Diversify your, your test samples. Really look into who is it who's going to be using your product. Um, you know, and even if those are rare cases with you know, high impacts or maybe danger really do test those things. Um, and we cannot always prevent all the bugs, but we can do some things. We can put some logs in a place to hopefully catch those bugs early and alert the people who really need to hear about that and not silently fail. If you're interested, also go read Next Generation 911 in US. That's another really interesting case. Um, simulate real behavior, real world behavior, um, and then Update your simulations. See how it's going, to, it's going to behave and go back and actually update your simulations. Systematic problems are most likely to happen when there are um, interface between multiple components. So integration tests are important. It's a light bulb moment. Um, and the code itself, your code is not computational thinking. Your tests, your simulations, documentations, they have to recreate that computational thinking that you had when you actually it went to your design of writing code. So with that, it really does take a village to come uh, and speak at a conference. I have to thank many people. Among them is Dave Thomas. He spent hours and hours with me when I was discovering these ideas, and he saved me from me going down the rabbit holes often. Uh, my partner in crime, Robert Norton, he's also an engineer. He has to listen to me all day and all night. Apparently, I was sleeping, like sleep talking about um, configuring a server some nights. <laughs> and then my team at Tandem, um, that I'm very lucky to be working with such great people. If you're in the United States and looking for a job, please call me and get in touch. That's all I have.